Big decisions require research. So if your teenager is considering a decision as big as joining the military, they're doing their homework. You can too, by visiting todaysmilitary.com because their success tomorrow begins with your support today. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Hi there. Thanks for joining us. This is Space Nuts, where we talk astronomy, space, uh, space science, and pineapple shirts. <laughs> My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host. <laughs> Coming up on this episode, uh, more news on uh, moon water or Luna H2O, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, they've found some, and it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit strange. Uh, we'll also be revisiting an old friend, Oumuamua, the space doogie. Uh, they've uh, come up with a new theory or maybe some new science as to why it did what it did when it passed by uh, a couple of years ago now, a few years ago now. We will also be answering questions on the DART mission, rogue planets passing Earth, and asteroids hitting us. People are seemingly intrigued by all these what ifs and i am too we'll answer them all and give you plenty of information on this edition of space nuts 15 seconds guidance is internal 10 9 ignition sequence start space nuts 5 4 3 2 1 2 3 4 5 5 4 3 2 1 space nuts astronauts report it feels good Joining me, as always, is uh, his good self, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. How are you today? I, I am quite well. Do you like my shirt? Uh, yeah, the pineapples are below the limit of resolution on my screen. And I'll they move actually, up. Uh, well, tiny no, they, they still look like insects, I'm afraid. Oh, they right. just look yeah, like they probably are. It's crawling all over you. <laughs> now that you mention it, they just look like <laughs> black and white ladybugs. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so... <laughs> um, change of well, because I don't have a pineapple shirt. Uh, changing topic, wasn't it nice to see Space Nuts coming fifth in the top 20 space podcasts a week or so ago? Of all time. Oh. No, I don't know. But uh, yeah, we got a really great review and uh, they ranked us uh, number five in yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, astronomy and space science or science in general, I think it was, uh, podcasts. And uh, they said some really nice things about they it. Did. So they obviously only listened for a couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, That's right. It might, must have been a good couple of minutes, really. Yes. No, it's really, really good. I, it's nice to get um, some feedback, especially from people who are influential. And we uh, believe so, so yes. it, it's nice to be um, sort of up there in the ranking. So uh, yeah. that's terrific. Very, yeah. very pleased with that. Uh, and hopefully we can keep it going. It's only taken us 20,000 years to get here. So <laughs> It did comment um, not only on uh, the, the erudite pre presenters that this podcast has. Where, <laughs> what, what universe do they live in? Anyway, not only on the erudite presenters, but also on the production. What a great production it is. And that might have something to do with that guy who you, you always say never does anything. Hugh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hugh? <laughs> Yeah, he, he does work very hard, and I, I, I does, do give yeah. him a bit of stick. But, you know, he was my boss for many years, so now it's payback oh, I time. I didn't know that. Ah, yes, he was. Go. Yes. Well, that explains it, a lot. <laughs> as you go through life, things uh, things change. So he was my boss. Um, I, I, if, when I've got time, I'll tell you a really great story about him that <laughs> dates back to when I was a kid and do, doing job experience. Right. Because um, <laughs> it was the last thing I ever told him before I left the ABC, and he had no idea. <laughs> but um, it was it's a great story. So please remind me to tell that one day because it's quite a long story. All right. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's funny how things happen in life. So Hugh used to be my boss, but I used to be the boss of the now state member for Dubbo. <laughs> oh, oh, that's remarkable. All right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so he's now an MP, uh, but I used to be his boss. That's my claim uh, to fame. Very good. Yes. So yeah. I taught him everything he knows. Although after last weekend, he's now in opposition. Yes, yes, mm. there you go. <laughs> not astro not astronomically speaking. No, no, he's, no. He's on the other side of this. He's on, on the, the other, other side, side of the sun. <laughs> yes, exactly. 
All right, let's get down to business, Fred, because uh, we've got a bit to get through. And uh, this this story about water on the moon is quite intriguing. What's going on? It, it is, and it's it's. I mean, you and I have talked about water on the moon before, um, it, particularly about the fact that um, we several spacecraft have detected what looks like sheets of ice, effectively in the uh, in the deep craters near the moon's south pole, yeah. and, that, and that's one reason why the Artemis mission is targeting the moon's south polar region uh, for its first human uh, crude landing uh, in a, from two, three years, something like that, maybe a little bit more. Um, yeah. So uh, because that seems to be just ice that has, has formed there, uh, probably through maybe, you know, comet in, in, impacts billions of years ago. Uh, but it, it, it's it's easy to get your head around that, that there might be ice, it, it, even if it may be, you know that the lunar soil particles have got coatings of ice on them. Uh, that that's something we can understand. But the latest uh, discovery is a little bit more counterintuitive than that, and it comes from uh, the Chang'e Five uh, space mission, uh, the China National Space Administration, yeah. which in 2020, I think it's towards the end of 2020, returned soil samples from the moon. Uh, which were selected uh, from obviously from the Chang'e Five landing site, which was in Oceanus Procellarum, the Ocean of Storms, the biggest yeah. of the of the basalt lava fields that there is on the Moon. Uh, from our perspective uh, here in Australia, when you look at the Moon, it's in the lower right hand end. Uh, it's the upper left end when you're looking from the northern hemisphere. It's the biggest of the of the grey patches, of, uh, the ocean of storms. So that was the landing site, and it's the first time we've had samples re uh, returned to Earth from that site. Uh, none of the Apollo astronauts landed in the ocean of storms. It's a good place to stay away from if it's storming. Yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so... Um, so what we've got is uh, these, um, I guess, a few, several grams, I think, of lunar material were returned by Chang'e 5. And there's now uh, some really quite remarkable results come from them because they contain uh, glass beads. Now, these glass beads are somewhere between, uh, you know, well under a millimeter in diameter, uh, you know, a small fraction of a millimeter, perhaps human hair size. I'm not sure of the size of human hair because I don't have much. Uh, and um, the but range up to I think a little bit more than a little bit under a centimeter. So okay. they're 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 not microscopic. They're things that you can see if you have have them in your hand. Uh, but they have been investigated, uh, and they contain uh, water molecules within the you know within the within the glass bead. There are water molecules there. And so um, the interest is, how did they get there? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the st well, the story is that, uh, first of all, where did the glass beads come from? And these are thought to be beads that are uh, created when micrometeorites hit the surface of the moon. These are you know, probably just things the size of a coin or something like that, or a small stone, uh, hit the moon's surface. Because and they hit it at maybe 30, 40 kilometers per second because there's no atmosphere to slow them down. And that yeah. the energy of that impact actually throws up some of the lunar surface, basically explodes, heats it to a very high temperature very briefly, uh, and you get glass forming because rock is silica and glass is silica as well. It's just a different form of it. Now, the interesting aspect is that these are different beads from what the Apollo astronauts found in their investigation. So ah. the, the Apollo landing sites uh, were all in the smaller Maria. The, uh, Maria is just the posh word for seas uh, on the moon. Uh, it's the old term for you know what, what these gray areas were. Uh, yeah. And the, the, the beads that, the glass beads that were found in the Apollo soil samples seem to be mostly caused by volcanic uh, phenomena. So you, we we on Earth we see volcanic glass. It's it's rock that's been heated so hot that it turns into glass, uh, and that's commonly found around volcanoes, as you might expect. Yes. Uh, but that is different in its structure from uh, 
beads that are heated by micrometeorites. I'm not sure what the differences are. I suspect it's to do with uh, the, the the speed with which the, the the thing is heated to its high temperature. Um, yeah. The I've seen pictures of these glass beads from the uh, from the Changi sample compared with the glass beads from the Apollo samples, and the most obvious difference is that the the Apollo beads are green and the Changi green. Uh, beads are black, uh, so there is there's a, an, an obvious difference there that might not have anything to do with their origin, but that's that you know that dis, dis differentiates them at least at some level. Anyway, to cut to the story, so yes, the the question is, uh, how did the water molecules get inside the glass beads? Yeah. And the theory that has been developed by a uh, large group of scientists, including many uh, scientists from China, but it's an inter international group as well. Um, the, they believe that what happens is that, the, of course, the lunar surface is bathed in the, the solar wind, the wind of subatomic particles that comes from the sun, uh, which we are largely shielded from by the atmosphere, um, that hits full force on the surface of the moon. Now, most of that solar wind is hydrogen nuclei, it's protons. Right. Um, and so uh, the what you've got is basically hydrogen constantly flowing onto the surface of the moon. And hydrogen is, uh, be, being the lightest element, it's also the one that can creep into structures most easily. Uh, it, in fact, you probably know that, you know, one of the problems with a hydrogen balloon is it leaks because the hydrogen just finds its way out, yeah. uh, being the lightest element. Well, the com the uh, converse is the case with these beads. The hydrogen has leached its way into the uh, into the glass beads. The glass is essentially porous on the scale oh, of no. hydrogen atoms. So yep. hydrogen comes from the sun, gets into the beads, and it finds uh, oxygen in there. And so you've got a reaction that takes place within the bead and you've got a water molecule being formed. And so that's the, uh, the theory behind why this, th these um, beads are so rich in water molecules. And it turns out that there's probably millions, if not billions, of tons of this stuff wow. on the moon, um, which is exciting people as being a possible source of water for future lunar explorers. And that interesting thing about this is that it's not just near the South Pole. It's kind of everywhere on the moon's surface. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, the, in fact, it may even be as simple as just uh, heating these things up till they, uh, till they melt and then uh, collecting the vapor that comes off and condensing out the water that comes from it. It might be a bit more complicated than that. But So are they saying that this is water that's been created due to uh, an interaction between yeah. um, hydrogen and, and, the, and the glass beads uh, rather than water that was already yeah. existent? That's right. Now, wow. that might be there too uh, because, yeah. um, you know, we, we think some of the Earth's water uh, was actually, you know, it came from the rocks themselves, which were... Uh, when when the Earth was for, w was being formed by pre-existing yep. water molecules, water in space is very very common. Uh, it's in fact the most common two element molecule in the universe. How about the that? Mo the most common single element molecule is molecular hydrogen, uh, because hydrogen's the the commonest element by far. But yeah. if you having two elements together, uh, then water is the commonest of all of them. Yeah. So yeah, so really, you know, really interesting finding that might one day have quite uh, significant um, implications for the human exploration of the moon. Because water Indeed. not only provides something to drink, it's also rocket fuel. Uh, when yes, you, exactly. When you, yeah, when exactly. You and, I, and I know you said that's why they've chosen the the South Pole as uh, as a landing zone. I think there's another reason actually, because they uh, won't have to look up to see Earth; they can just look straight ahead. Is that uh, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it could be. You don't have to yeah. look up. You did you crick your neck. Uh, no, I mean, exactly. It, yeah. Um, uh, uh, that was uh, a chiropractor's idea, actually. <laughs> I um, I also wondered. I got to, as you were talking, something crossed my mind because you were explaining how, uh, depending on where you are on the planet, where this particular zone was from yep. an observer's point of view. Yep. I was just wondering if you were looking at the moon, constantly looking at the moon, and you were flying in a plane, 
and you're moving from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere, how would the moon change? I mean, if it changes perspectives depending on where you're standing, what would happen if you crossed the equator in a plane while you were looking at the moon? Uh, it passes over your head. Um, it goes oh, okay. up overhead and ends up the other way up. Is you that know, right? Yeah, Would it like an instantaneous effect? No, no. It's just gradual. As you, it's supposing ah. you were on a plane flying from so the North it, Pole to the South Pole, and the yeah. moon was in front of you when you left. It'd be behind you when when you got there. It'd be the other way up. <laughs> yeah, I I just wondered how you would notice the change, but it would just be a gradual rotation, yes, that's right. I suppose. Yeah, and and it will essentially pass over your head. You know, I've probably told you this before, Andrew, but there's a this exactly this thing. Um, uh, gave me one of my worst moments in astronomy oh. uh, because back in uh, June 1978, I was making my first visit from Scotland, where I lived, uh, to Australia, and I had time uh, awarded to me on the Anglo-Australian telescope, and it was going to be dark time when the moon was new, uh, so essentially not in the sky. That was uh because the ob objects I was trying to observe were very faint and it would have been absolutely useless trying to observe them in yeah. uh, when the moon was above the horizon. So it was new moon time. Um, I did all my calculations, got the right dates and everything, got on the plane, uh, headed down to Australia. So the last leg of the journey uh, was down coming into Sydney uh, and I was on the, uh, must have been on the eastern side of the plane, <laughs> Uh, looked out the window, and there's the moon. And it looked to me as if it was at first quarter. Well, first quarter is a week away from full moon. Um, but, of course, it's upside down. So it's actually <laughs> last, quarter, last quarter, which is a week away from new moon. But it, re it absolutely freaked me out. I Damn. thought, I've done it all wrong. I've calculated everything wrong. It's going to be full next week when I've got time on my telescope, and I won't see a thing. <laughs> and 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 I, I I calm yourself, Fred. Calm yourself. Just think about this. The moon is upside uh, down from the southern hemisphere, so first quarter looks like last quarter. But it, it yeah. really did freak me out for a match of minutes till I calmed down and worked out what was happening. Oh yes, yeah. I'm on the other side of the world. No, I can understand that you duped yourself. I remember coming into Sydney one morning as the sun was rising, and I couldn't figure out why. I could see the sunrise to the left of the plane and not the right. I thought, hang on a minute, there's something weird exactly. going on here. They realised we not we weren't flying east. You don't fly east out from the United States to Australia. You fly, fly. <laughs> um, sorry, west. Uh, yeah. You fly southwest. Yes. So naturally, the sunrise is going to be to your left. Yeah. But yeah. I couldn't figure it out. I'm sitting yeah. there. I'm jet lagged to hell. <laughs> but I'm yeah. trying to figure it out. I just yeah, my brain that, wouldn't that, wouldn't yeah. process the information properly. I, I think that was my problem as well. It's, uh, mm. My first experience of serious jet lag. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it can really affect you. It's it's a bizarre thing. All right. Uh, so yeah, uh, maybe another source of water on the moon in in those beads. Fascinating. This is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Space nuts. Now, Fred, uh, to an old friend, we've we've spoken about Oumuamua many times. Now, this is a uh, an object that passed through our uh, solar system, uh, passed reasonably close to uh, the inner planets, and then uh, passed by the sun. Uh, it did so in an unusual way. It changed direction, and of course, that got a lot of people saying, "Oh, it must be a spaceship." Uh, <laughs> but uh, it was also known to be an extra solar asteroid. It was not of this solar system. It's come from somewhere else. Uh, but now there's some more information that it might explain why it did what it did. Yeah, that's right. So so it, it's such an interesting object. Um, and you always call it the space doogie. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I used don't to either. call it the uh, the breadstick uh, or something, or a cigar well, or well, something. Didn't it turn out to be a pancake or yes, something? Yes, that's right. Mm. It's most likely to be an object... Uh, 115 by 111 meters uh, across and about 19 meters thick. So it's a sort of roughly pancake-shaped object. Uh, and that the, the, the problem is the only thing you've got to, to go by is the light curve, the way this object, which is tilting through, uh, tumbling through space is probably the right word. Um, yeah. it's, it's bright as, it, as, it, as the sunlight changes uh how much of its surface you see, it's 
uh, its um, brightness varies actually by a factor of 12. It's huge. It's an enormous yeah. factor. And that tells you it is a funny shape. It was, as, as we said, first of all, thought to be the shape of a, of a breadstick, uh, but now is more like a pancake. Um, and that actually gave, well, yeah, was it, let, let me, I'll, I'll postpone that comment. Uh, let, let me um, first of all mention that the way scientists knew that it was an interstellar traveler was the speed that it came into the solar system. Uh, it was uh, first observed actually on the 19th of October, 2017. So it's getting on for six years ago. Wow. Uh, and it was uh, up from the, uh, Haleakala, the summit of Haleakala, the, the uh, extinct volcano on the island of Maui where the PanStars 1 telescope is operated. Uh, and that's why it got a Hawaiian name, Umuamua, meaning first messenger from afar, um, which is what it is. And its yeah. speed, 87 kilometers per second, uh, was what gave it away as coming from outside because things don't travel at that speed that originate with, uh, within the solar system, even from the Oort cloud, which is on the very edge of the solar system. So uh -huh. that's all fine. Uh, it was observed by as many telescopes as, as humankind could get on it. But what was uh, the mystery was that it uh, its orbit uh, did not, behave as you would expect if the only forces on it were gravi were, the only force on it was gravity um, so it had what are called non -gravi non gravitational perturbations its orbit was being changed by some non gravitational effect and it was more than just the the straightforward pressure of the solar wind on it which is actually one of the things that changes comets orbits yeah uh, so um, that caused the mystery and yes you're right um, uh, Avi Loeb of the Harvard uh, Institute for Astrophysics, I think he still thinks it's an alien spaceship that was actually using its thrusters to change its orbit. A very distinguished scientist, but always very controversial and very Indeed. provocative in what he says. Uh, but the more sober um, uh, fraternity of the astronomical community uh, has been looking for mechanisms by which it might be changing its orbit. And um, one one of the theories was, and we, I think we talked about this, was that when it was established that it was a pancake shape, uh, it was uh, thought to be possibly uh, a, a sort of shard of material that had been shaved off an object like Pluto. Yeah. Uh, um, a, a, some, a, a, um, a dwarf planet in some distant solar system that had a collision with something else. Uh, yeah. Lots of fragments came off, and something uh, the shape of a of a pancake flew through space. Now its color was quite reddish, and parts of Pluto are reddish, and that's thought to be due to uh, solid nitrogen having been bombarded by decades, sorry, billions of years of solar uh, of um, uh, cosmic rays. Um, you know the the, the subatomic particles that come from the from the universe in general, rather than from the yep. sun. Uh, turning it red, uh, that's a known process. Uh, and so there was a suggestion some time ago that it was a solid chunk of nitrogen that was outgassing, and it was when the nitrogen got illuminated by the sun or heated by the sun, it was outgassing, and that was providing a thrust. But um, that sort of didn't work. It seemed to, uh, it, it, it's, uh, seemed to be uh, a long stretch of the imagination as to how something like a solid body of nitrogen, and actually molecular hydrogen was suggested as well uh, as being the same sort of thing. How could that survive? So the latest theory, uh, 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 it's actually in some ways similar to what we've just been talking about regarding the moon. It's the way, yeah. uh, well, the way subatomic particles behave in space. Uh, so you've got this thing that may well be made mostly of water, um, because that will be the most likely thing, that it's an iceberg, a bit like a comet would be uh, on uh, in our own solar system. Um, yeah. But the the thinking is, and this work was has come from, uh, it's California, yeah, University of California, Berkeley, yeah. um, and uh, somebody at Cornell University. These are two scientists who've, who've basically put a different mechanism as the, uh, as the possible comet, uh, possible um, culprit. Uh, what they're suggesting is that the 
if you've got just a bog standard IC uh, comet like uh, object, it's constantly being bombarded by uh, the cosmic rays that I just mentioned from the universe. And it turns in, to, it turns out, sorry, not turns in, turns out that uh, the effect of these cos cosmic rays is to penetrate the ice and essentially uh, create hydrogen atoms. So you get basically buildup of hydrogen gas under the deep under the surface because it's the cosmic rays are you know they, they can go a long way into the ice yeah. and and the suggestion now is that that those reservoirs of hydrogen within the body itself as it got near the sun the sun heated the surface the ice sort of melted a bit and let the hydrogen out on the side of uh, the side of the object that was most most facing the sun because it's tumbling so it's not Simply a, a you know a, a one side that's facing the sun, um, and that the calculations show that that would produce enough thrust to give you exactly the uh, exactly the uh, changes in the orbit that have ah. been suggested. It's a long. Uh, it's actually uh, once again this this comes from phys.org, one of our favourite websites, uh, which is titled "A Surprisingly Simple Explanation for Oumuamua's Weird, Weird Orbit." I don't think it's that simple, but it does tell you uh, in detail in that article, and you can look at the original paper as well, uh, what the conclusion is, that it is uh, you know that it is essentially uh, a fairly standard object, but um, having had um, probably billions of years in the full glare of cosmic rays without the, uh, you know, a magnetic field to, to change them, which we have in the solar system, uh, that yeah. might very well be why that is the outgassing or causing the outgassing that's given the uh, given rise to the comet? Uh, sorry, to the orbit changes. Yes, it also changed speed, didn't it? Yes, that's right. It did. Well, it, it, it would have to if its orbit alters; it changes its speed as well. Yeah. So, yes. It's just, and in fact, it's a, it, the it is a change of speed because what changes an orbit is an acceleration, and that's what what well you would know that that is a change of speed. Indeed. <laughs> Um, it's not the only one, of course. We had uh, Borisov as well. Yeah. Um, did it change direction and speed too? Or? Yes, but Borisov... So I've kind of missed the fundamental problem with uh, Oumuamua, which was that there was absolutely no visible tail or coma or any of the things that you normally associate with this kind of activity. You would expect to see that gas uh, radiating in some way, uh, i.e. being bright in telescopes. And that didn't happen with Oumuamua, but it did with Borisov. Uh, ah. Borisov was much more like a typical comet. It was very, you know, st its behavior was quite standard. Even though it was known, again, by its velocity to have come from outside the solar system, it behaved like a comet within the solar system. Uh, Oumuamua didn't. It, it showed no sign of any kind of outgassing at all, yet its orbit changed. So something yeah. was happening. Okay, uh, and they were both going too fast to be captured, weren't they? they yes, they went, that's right. And they're on their way somewhere else. I'm just uh, thinking also about a Muamua. If it it was you know, part of an obliterated dwarf planet, I guess there's a probability that um, other parts of that <laughs> yeah. doomed planet are flying off in all sorts of directions in the universe. Yes, that's right. Um, and uh, you you know, depending on how far away it was, it I mean, it could be. It could be millions or billions of light years away, the, the parent yeah. body. Um, and uh, um, so they could be going in, you know, you, the, the, the likelihood of finding two of them coming together uh, in the solar system is up very low. I think even if they set off in the same direction, uh, just, you know, a degree or two difference in their directions, by the time you get to the solar system, a billion light years away or a million light years away, uh, those two Maybe objects are... Squillions, squillions of kilometres apart. apart. That's exactly yeah. right, yeah. Mm. Um, so, so sorry, uh, just to, to wrap up, though, the thinking now is that this is more... that Oumuamua is more likely to be something like a comet rather than like a chunk of a dwarf planet that's been broken off. Okay. So, yeah. Very good. All right. Um, we I guess we'll probably get more news on it. I know they're still analysing the data, but... Um, um, and, and there was a talk of chasing it at some stage, but uh, it it's was, just yes. moving so fast. And yeah. Gosh, it'll be a long, long way away already. So, um, yeah, I think we could probably put that idea to bed. But, um, yeah, there was a lot of data captured and they're 
I'll yeah. continue to analyze it, I'm sure. I've, yeah, I, I think we covered this story that um, it might have been Elon Musk uh, and SpaceX, <laughs> but um, the idea was to to send a spacecraft to rendezvous, to, to, to rendezvous with it. And I think the earliest it was going to get there was 2050 or something. It was going to be yeah. long, long down the track. And, Indeed, it would yeah, be. Yeah. Mm. All right. Uh, this is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems and in with a go. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, it's time to deal with some audience questions. I thought we'd uh, tackle a few text questions today because um, we tend to lean more towards the audio. Uh, and a couple of questions we've got are of a similar ilk, but we'll get to them in a minute. This first one comes from John in Dayton, uh, Ohio, I assume, in the United States. Uh, he said, I was looking at the images after the DART mission impact, and I was intrigued by the uh, streamers that appeared to be emanating from uh, Dimorphos. Uh, is it possible that these were chunks of ice that explosively sublimated after being exposed to the heat of impact? Uh, could that also have provided an additional shove that affected the orbit even more than we had originally estimated? If so, do you think they'll uh, consider different methods of deflection for different types of asteroids, uh, as in rubble piles versus solid rock, etc.? Uh, thank you both for a wonderful show. You're lovely people, and you're the bright spot of my week. Take care. Well, oh, that's nice. That's thank like, you, John. That's yeah, that's gosh. really lovely. Appreciate yep. those comments. Uh, yeah, the DART mission, uh, the, they're continuing to analyze the data, but it's, uh, it's proved to be incredibly successful. The, um, the orbit change was more than they expected. Um, but yeah, um, he brings up an interesting point. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, so the, uh, in fact, we've, uh, within the last week, got new images from the European Southern Observatory's telescopes of this, the aftermath of the impact, which, um, I have to confess, I haven't had time to look at it. It's been a very busy week. But um, uh, effectively, what John's saying is absolutely right. Um, the, the, the impact itself basically caused an explosion uh, because it's hitting a solid-ish surface. It might be a bit of a rubble pile, but it's still, still fairly solid. Uh, and just that half tonne of material hitting it at six kilometres per second causes a huge generation of heat um, and lots of stuff vaporized. And then I, I assume that what we're seeing with those streamers, and that's it, John's exactly right, there are uh, that there are there's some really quite spectacular straight lines of stuff. Uh, and they're straight because everything travels in a straight line in space yep. um, in the sense that you don't have, you know, winds blowing it around and things of that sort. Um, so that, is I think the probably the dusty debris. Uh, so it may be stuff that even that's recondensed. I'm, I, I should have got my head around the physics of all this. But basically, what you're seeing is is the debris cloud that came from that. Um, and John's absolutely right. The uh, the explosive effect of the impact, the energy that was generated, the explosive energy, did add to the change of Dimorphos's orbit. Uh, and I think it was, um, you, you know, if you, if, you, if I'm trying to remember the numbers, we did look at this. Uh, yeah. That just a straightforward cloud by a heavy object, um, it, yes, that will move the orbit slightly. But because of the explosive effect, um, if I remember rightly, it was between two and five times more uh, uh, thrust than you would just get from from the simple uh, kinetic impact, you know, hitting something and, and it moving away. Uh, what you get is an, exp an additional explosive effect that actually uh, vastly magnifies the effect of the uh, of the collision. So and that has been very very encouraging uh, to uh, all of the mission scientists. So DART, yes, a, a, a success story which is still being told. I think as uh, John's question uh, actually confirms. Yeah, and he does suggest uh, maybe different method methodology yes, for uh, different yeah. types of targets, and that's yep. probably a logical thing to consider. Yep, yep, absolutely. Mm. Um, but I, I suppose the way we deal with a future threat is going to be based on how big it is, what it's made up of, and how much time we've got. Yes, it's all about the time, that's right. 
So they'll be they'll be the various elements. And and, and just to um, you know draw the line under it, there's nothing uh, bigger than a hundred. 140 meters, I think. Nothing known yet with a probability of impact within the next century. Uh, and and remind us again what a 100 meter object would do if we had a direct hit. Ah, I'm glad you asked me that. <laughs> uh, well, a 100 meter object is uh, it, it's absolutely deadly over areas the size of states, uh, maybe uh, even continent sized. Uh, oh. So you've got a one to two kilometer crater, um, and um, and mass casualties, uh, and we think there are about twenty five thousand of these, uh, oh. of which we think something like forty percent have been discovered so far. That is what the whole asteroid search program is working on at the moment: uh, objects in the hundred and forty meter class thereabouts. Uh. We've, we've had a few pass close to Earth in recent yes, times. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, in the last month or two, uh, one of them actually passing between the Earth and the Moon. Um, of course, the popular press go with the doomsday headline, but we know, we've always known that they're not going to hit us. It's yeah. the ones we don't yeah. know about that that's we, right. need, we need to find. <laughs> exactly. Um, and that's why, you know, there's, there, there are moves afoot to put a, a spacecraft uh, inside the Earth's orbit, looking at the the Earth with the Sun behind, so you, you pick up things that would would look look as though they were coming out of the Sun from our perspective, yeah. uh, and that because they're the ones that you miss, you know, it's just yep. like the old World War Two. Oh, they came out to me, came at me out of the Sun. It's the same exactly. sort of thing. Um, so, but that project, I think we talked about it briefly a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah. Twenty twenty eight, I think, is where it's been pushed back to. Uh, may even be further than that. We need it now, really. Yeah, we do. We do really need it now, but uh, we'll get there soon enough. Hopefully it won't be too late. Oops. Uh, thank you, John. Um, now, I've got a couple of questions that are, uh, well, they're of a similar ilk. Uh, these next two kind of relate to each other. Uh, this comes from Patrick in uh, Northern Ireland. Hi, Patrick. Nice to hear from you. If a rogue planet, say Mars-sized, entered the solar system on the right trajectory and passed between the Earth and the Moon, what would happen tides earthquakes orbital changes love the show guys but you don't don't sound like you would uh, you don't sound like what you look like um i had you 30 years younger oh oh <laughs> um, the joy of radio I mean, yeah, said, yeah that's right radio is brilliant exactly yeah, i've got a face for radio <laughs> I'm glad, um, it, I'm glad it didn't say 50 years younger, which would probably be more appropriate yes. for me anyway. Yeah, well, that, that would be worse. That'll have that, you know, a couple of weeks away from that. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Patrick. Really nice of you. Uh, anyway, carry on. Um, if a rogue planet size of Mars entered uh, the solar system and passed between the Earth and the moon, what would what would happen? Do we want to know? <laughs> it, yeah, it would be, you know, it, it would be the end of... Everything really. Uh, oh, there you so, go. Yeah, there's something including uh, you know, Patrick. Uh, yes, uh, being, that's right. Yes, and that lovely part of the country, Northern Ireland. It's beautiful yeah. in spot. Haven't uh, been there yet. You should go. And I, I will. Yes, um, and I'll find Patrick. Well, you might. Yeah. Mm. Um, well, I'll find plenty of Patricks. It's yeah. just finding the right <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, you know, it's just the gravitational disturbance will be colossal. In fact, I don't even know whether it could, if the object was moving fast enough, yeah, maybe it could go between the Earth and the Moon without colliding with one of them. Yeah. Uh, but the but there will be such enormous tidal effects. It it, it would, I, I would guess, it would risk the integrity of the Earth's crust. It would Ooh. make uh, tectonic movement look pretty. Pretty leisurely, uh, I think something of that of that size, you know. So a, a, a non-survival survivable event, I imagine. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Mm. Yep. Don't need that. Any rogue planets in the vicinity that you know? Well, of no, from? that's the thing. The good thing about planets is they're big and they're easy to find, except uh, for I'll, Planet Nine. Can't find that. Well, well that's a very good point. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, just totally demolished my argument there. <laughs> Yeah, but it's not close. 
the good thing is planet nine's not on its way if it was no. anywhere you know if it was anywhere within uh the inner solar system there's part of the solar system where it could do any damage we'd know about it yes indeed <clears throat> Uh, so thanks for the question, Patrick. Nobody really wanted to know, but now we do. <laughs> but uh, we, we'd, we'd certainly be able to spot one um, a long way off. But I don't think we could do much about it if it was headed our way. No, that's uh, right. Yeah. Even a DART sort of mission would probably not be at all effective. Uh, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yes. But um, hopefully there aren't too many rogue planets in the vicinity. Um, thank you, Patrick. Let's move on to our final question. This one comes from Javier in Puerto Rico. I don't think we've had a question from Puerto Rico before. Uh, hello, guys. In a previous episode, someone asked about an object big enough to change the orbit of the Earth, and the professor said it would be easier to change its rotation. My question is, if an asteroid impacted the Earth and increased the speed at which it rotates on its axis, would the orbit increase as a result of the additional angular momentum in time? Uh, also, uh, would it maintain the new rotational speed or would it eventually return to its normal speed? Thank you for the show. Big fan. Thank you, uh, Javier Sha or yeah, Javier. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, that's a, that's a, look, uh, we get a lot of questions like this, but I, I always enjoy them. <laughs> I do too. Um, Even Patrick's. So, <laughs> So the answer, Xavier, is um, the uh, to the last bit is that it would, you know, unless there was another perturbation, it would stay. Uh, the, the The new rotation would would basically stay permanently, ah. um, because you've added angular momentum. Uh, but even you know uh, a Mars-sized object hitting the Earth, which is how we think the Moon was formed. Uh, would certainly have changed the rotation, um, but and it, and actually something that size would have changed the orbit too. It's it's just um, you know an, an enormous impact. Something the size of an asteroid wouldn't know. Uh, and you're right about the angular momentum, but uh, that would not be transferred externally to the Earth's orbit. It would be a, perhaps an increase or decrease in rotation. We we think that's possibly happened already with the Chicxulub event. Yeah. Um, the, there would have been a very slight change in the Earth's rotation as well as a slight change in where the pole of the Earth was. But you're talking about microseconds and, uh, you know, centimetres almost on, on the surface of the Earth. Uh, so it's not a large effect, even for a 15-kilometre-sized body, which uh, the Chicxulub asteroid probably was. Yeah. Um, but once again, the orbit, the Earth's orbit would would largely remain unchanged. Yeah, I was just trying to look up the Chicxulub event because I wanted to, I couldn't remember what year it was, but the funny thing is with the Google search I just did, as I'm looking through the list of websites that feature the Chicxulub uh, impact, <laughs> Google's very clever, very cleverly just um, had an asteroid pass across <laughs> my screen. Yes. I didn't. Yeah. I'm going to refresh that and do it again because it was very funny. I, I, I think I've seen that. There it yes. is. <laughs> yeah. The, the, oh. I think there was something similar. And uh, then the screen shakes when it hits yes, the bottom of right. the screen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen that before. That's hilarious. Uh, the clever one, I can't remember what it was, but something similar to that. Uh, I was Googling something last week and something came in from the side and hit it and the whole page was tilted <laughs> over. It, it, I don't know how you do that. The whole text of the of the of the you know the Google page was actually on a tilt. Uh, it, aren't they clever? Oh, aren't they getting clever? Well, I just love you know. little things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm easily pleased. Yeah, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just. What year was it again? Nineteen. The, I know that's uh, the Tunguska event you're talking oh, about. Oh, of course, yeah. yes, which was 1908. Uh, oh, of course, yeah. Yes. Chicxulub. Yeah, was, I'm getting them mixed Chicks, up. Chicxulub. That was 15th of February, uh, 66 million years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Of course. When? <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, yeah, and, so, and of um, course, was not far from uh, Puerto Rico, where uh, uh, Xavier is from. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. Um, so the answer is we probably wouldn't change orbit, but yeah. the rotation might change it's, with an asteroid. It, it, it is. To change the orbit, you need an external force, something that's, you know, really... Hitting it hard, yeah, uh, it's a hard thing to change. 
Okay. Thanks, Javi. A great question. Really enjoyed that one. And thanks to Patrick and John for sending in their questions as well. Uh, and don't forget, you can send a question in to us if you would like us to try and tackle it. Uh, just uh, jump on our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. There's an AMA link at the top. You click on that, you can send us text or audio questions. Or on the right-hand side, just um, click on send us your voice message. If you've got a device with a microphone, that's all we need. Don't forget to tell us who you are and where you're from because we, we love to know and we love to hear your voices, but we like your text questions as well. And plenty more on the website to check out also. And a special thanks to our patrons, the people who voluntarily put a little bit of money into the kitty every week to keep the lights on. That is fantastic. We really appreciate that. Fred, we're done for another day. Thank you so much, sir. It's a pleasure, Andrew. Uh, anytime. Uh, in fact, probably quite soon. <laughs> yeah, very, very possible indeed. Very possible. Uh, Fred Watson, astronomer at large, uh, joining us on Space Nuts every week to uh, talk the talk. And the man who walks the walk is Hugh back in the studio. Well, he actually does a lot of sitting, lounging and coffee drinking, but he also pushes buttons occasionally. Thank you, Hugh. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for listening. We'll catch you on the very, very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.